What is up, everybody? Mr. Purse here. Welcome to Topic 3.3, Land-Based Empires, 1450 to 1750. We're going to get into one of my favorite empires today, the Mughal Empire, which if you don't know, I'm just jumping right into this. No background here. Let's just get right into this. We're talking 1526, 1858. Who are they, you might be asking yourself? Give me a little contextualization. You remember contextualization? I remember it. Contextualization is when we go a little bit back prior to the start of this to give you a little background information. So here is the contextualization. The Mughals are a kind of, essentially a mix of two different ethnic groups. One is Turkish people who are from Central Asia up here. One is the Mongolian people who are from up here. They eventually in the 1500s make their way down here and begin to conquer part of what is known as South Asia. Uh, the word Mughal comes from, it sounds like the word Mongol. It is from the word Mongol. It's the Persian word for Mongol. And if you don't know where Persia is, Persia is over here, which was the Safavid Empire. Um, so it really refers to Mongol. And you could kind of consider these like an offshoot of the Mongol Empire if you really want to get crazy and just wild and whatever. Um, they are primarily going to be Sunni Muslim, uh, the people who are the leaders of the Mughal Empire. Um, so that's they are a, a Muslim group coming in to India. Let me say it again. They are a Muslim group coming into India. What should you know about India? One of the first things you should think about when I say the word India and historically what you should think about Hinduism. So we're going to have a little bit of a conflict here, but we're looking at modern day India, Bangladesh over here, a little bit into Pakistan. Um, we got a lot of stuff going on. So let's rock and roll. First thing, this is the similar format we've been following with the other two with the Ottoman and the Safavids. We're going to do the same thing in the next one with the Qing. This is the expansion of the Mughal Empire. First is all these empires are expanding through gunpowder. They have cannons, they have guns. It allows them to expand when you, the people who you are fighting against don't have as good of weapons. So as a result of this, the Mughals have access to these and they are able to expand. And they also have a very organized military structure. They have five branches of government. Each branch is trained to do a very specific task, very specific duty. We have the infantry, foot soldiers. We have the cavalry on horses. We have the guys who can fire the guns and the cannons. We got the elephants. Yes, elephants. And I'll get to them in a minute. And we got the war boats. We are located along a coastline and a very active trade route in the Indian Ocean trade route. So... We need to have some war boats to protect ourselves on the coastline. Um, also, India had been decentralized for 1,000 years. We're going all the way back to the Gupta time period, which is like classical civilizations, three, four, five hundreds. And they've been decentralized since. If you remember from Unit 1, India was decentralized. Generally, when places are decentralized, it's easy to conquer them because you are fighting against this little kingdom and this, and you're not fighting against a unified front. So the Mughals are able to expand starting in the 1560s and eventually expanding to this at their peak in the early 1700s. Crazy, right? So coming back to this, number two, how do they govern their empire? Great question. Oh, I got it right here. So here's what I got for you. Number one, government structure. We are centralized. We have one leader. That leader is in charge and oversees the rest of the empire. Does the does that leader make a decision about what you eat every day? Not necessarily. Does the leader get to decide what you what you do for a living? Not necessarily, but the laws are carried out. It's under the orders of this one person. However, this one person needs to carry out a lot of laws. So for example, if you take the biggest state in the United States in terms of population, California, for example, you have to take California and you divide it up as California is into essential, essentially counties. So you divide up India into these counties or provinces, which are called subas, and you take these subas and you divide them up. And then you divide those counties or provinces in this case, into districts, which is what you see in most states in the United States today. So in this case, we have 15, then we appoint someone who's in charge. So as the emperor, I get to appoint people, whether I appoint them to these governorships or whether I keep the person who was in power before to make them happy. I also appoint the head of the military and taxation and the imperial household and the judiciary. So it gives me a lot of power because I'm appointing people who I know are A, loyal to me, B, who I might just trust to make decisions, or C, know who will kind of tell me what I need to hear in order to be effective at my ruling. Um, under Akbar, just to kind of show this centralized authority, anyone who gets any conviction in the Mughal Empire is allowed to directly appeal it to Akbar. And if he decides he wants to hear it, you can plead your case in front of him and he can overturn any conviction by anyone, anywhere. Almost like uh, a pardon in a sense. So we have that going on. So we have this centralized government structure. 
also we have these monumental architecture, which is a common theme during this period. People who are wealthy, which is a common theme probably today, I wouldn't know, but people who are wealthy generally like to build themselves big palaces or big houses to show how powerful they are. And this is, in this case, we're really going to see in Mughal Empire, really a blend of Persian, Turkish, Indian, a little Arabic influence, um, where they're going to blend all these styles together to kind of create this, this monumental architecture. This is the most famous, obviously, I know most people recognize this, but in case you don't, this is the Taj Mahal. Uh, this is in India. And this was commissioned actually by Akbar's son. You will see, if you remember your Islamic in architecture, we have minarets on the side. Uh, we have pointed arches. We have the dome. It's like typical Islamic influence, but also with a lot of this, you know, the reflecting pool, we see influence from Persia as well as Turkey or the Turkish influence. And just another example of a, a little palace right here. So good stuff. Um, in terms of C, we got military and bureaucrats. So how are we going to recruit military officials? How are we going to recruit a bureaucracy? What are we going to do? Unlike what we saw in the other empires during this period, there is a very small standing army. Um, the emperor kind of recruits and appoints this small standing army who are army, um, whether they're high ranking officials, whether they're soldiers who are constantly on what we consider to be today like active duty. Most military officials or most military um, members are really recruited by local nobles. So you're going to have almost, I don't want to call this feudalism and confuse you, but you have this idea that these local governors and districts are going to be asked by the emperor to contribute soldiers to the army. And you kind of maybe have a three month or six month or a year long commitment and then you'd return home. But they're not people who are like career soldiers in a sense. So um, they, the local leaders would contribute that to the army as an ability to allow them to stay in a central like local power, whether it's a mayor, governorship, whatever the case might be. Also, like I mentioned before, we have the five branches of the military. I just want to point out this one, the elephants down here. If you look at this awesome picture, which I find so cool because I'm such a dork, but this is uh, the armor that the elephants would wear. You can see you guys have two guys on it. They would probably be carrying some kind of spear or maybe a firearm. Um, and the elephants would just run and try and trample people. Like you can't really stop this huge elephant. I mean, why would you try? So it really is a solid military um, uh, military capability that the Mughals are going to have because of the elephants, which are local to that region. Also, we're going to have a bureaucracy. Again, bureaucracy are people who are working within the government on behalf of the emperor who are career government officials. Most of the high ranking government officials are going to be based on bloodline, not a meritocracy, not like an exam that you have to take. So we're going to appoint people to these high ranking officials. You get a nice title of like a no of nobility, which leads to more pay, which leads to more money, which leads to you being happier, uh, which leads to you carrying out the job and what the government wants you to do in return for all that. Um, most of these local bureaucrats are going to, again, provide soldiers back to the military. So you have this constant flow of, I appoint you, you give me something back, yet I'm still, it's still centralized power. So a little bit similar to like that feudal, like land and lawyer, that kind of stuff. But really, we ha we're all under the control of one king who is controlling absolutely. Also, we need taxes. Don't forget, taxes are important. Um, unlike other empires where we auction stuff off, this is called the Zamindar um, tax collection, where essentially the Mughals are going to appoint uh, who the tax collectors are. So instead of you buying the position, I just appoint who I want to collect taxes. They go out and collect taxes, mainly from peasants. Peasants is the primary source. Most people at this time period are peasants all around the world. And you need to provide one third of all crops to the government. So we avoid that kind of middleman thing that we see in others where people tax even higher, which works out. Also, we're going to tax cotton. Cotton is the main uh, production, non-farm product. I guess it is a farm product. That was kind of weird. Um, the main product that is going to be um, kind of really sought after outside of India, 25%, one quarter of all the world's production of cotton at this time comes from India. So people are going to travel to India to get cotton. That is like their thing. That's their export. That's what people want. And as Europeans start going out to try and find new routes to India and China, that's really what, that's one of the main things they're after is this cotton because who wants to wear a heavy wool uh, shirt when you can get a nice like cotton thing? I mean, come on, let's be honest. So one last thing uh, in terms of how they ruled. Remember the Hindus, um, India primarily is a Hindu country. It is a vast majority of people are Hindu and Hinduism has been ingrained in Indian culture because it had been around so long. Now you have this upstart Turkish Mongolian Sunni Muslim group trying to come in and conquer. 
Um, you got to figure out what to do if you are the Mughals. So what they decide is we're not going to oppress the Hindus to a certain degree. Instead, we are going to allow religious freedom. We are going to intentionally try and find Hindus to serve in our government. We're going to go out and we're going to recruit them and we're going to try and uh, make a conscious or what's called a concerted effort to bring Hindus into the government to kind of keep people happy and to find the best people. Also, we're going to end what's called the Jizya tax. And the Jizya tax was basically a tax in India and in many Muslim countries or Muslim regions on non-Muslims. So what Akbar says, we're going to get rid of this tax. We're not going to punish people for their religious beliefs financially, which everyone likes because no one wants to be taxed. Also, he doesn't, Akbar does encourage debates on faith, which is very uncommon for the time where he would bring in leaders who were not Muslim, who were Hindu, Christian, Jewish, um, Zoroastrianism, which is from Persia, and bring these people in to, to debate over to uh, Buddhism, to debate over topics of how you get to the afterlife, what are the major beliefs, um, and have people discuss this. And he really encouraged that. He was a very, Akbar is a very tolerant ruler. His great grandson, overturns most of these policies. And when he does, it really starts to lead to kind of a slow decline in uh, the Mughal empires. People kind of see themselves as the ability to rebel and they're not happy anymore. And one last thing, just want to point out, it's kind of like a side note to this. This time period does have a lot of new religions that are going to emerge, which doesn't necessarily tie into the Ottoman or the Safavid. Um, but in India, we do have a new religion called Sikhism. Uh, the People who practice Sikhism would be referred to as Sikhs, like S-E-E-K-S is how it's pronounced. But in this case, it's S-I-K-H. This is a religion that is formed in northern India and really started because people wanted to reject the caste system. Um, you can imagine if your family had been in the caste system as an untouchable or lower caste person for years. It's really a tough life. And this religion emerges out of that. There's a lot of similarities to Islam and Hinduism in this religion, but it's not like a branch of it. It's its own separate entity. They are monotheistic. Um, they do believe that God can't be defined, which should say there, but, um, and God, it, it is a, there is a cycle of life. There is, a, you are, you die and you are reborn based on your karma, your dharma. Um, you do pray multiple times a day. It's a very peaceful, it's historically a very peaceful religion. Um, it's a lot about, welcoming strangers, welcoming your neighbor into your home. Um, and this is kind of the typical Sikh uniform underneath the uniform underneath was wearing. You would keep your, uh, you do not cut your hair. So oftentimes it would be wrapped up in a bun or wrapped around the top. Long beard, you can see here. Um, also a sword, which is given to people, uh, given to as you go into adulthood. Um, and then underneath baggy shorts. This group of people are going to be, as we move forward in this class, are really kind of seen as outcasts in India. Um, a lot of people in the past 30 years have been leaving, migrating out of India to the United States. Um, and uh, especially if you live in the New York metro area um, and you go to New York City, there's a large population in the five boroughs of, um, of Sikhs trying to flee India because of oppression. So that's what I got. Any questions, as always, write them down. Let me know. I'm out.